So I guess we'll just start by talking a little bit about culture generally. So did you want to maybe get into a little bit about what is culture to you? Well, that's a big question, what is culture? Because culture means so many different things to so many different people. But for me, culture is connection. Culture is um, knowing who you are, what country you're from, knowing some of your language. Culture is knowing your traditional practices. Culture is fluid. I think we forget that too. Um, Aboriginal people are, live now in contemporary Aboriginal culture. We don't live in humpies and we don't wear lap laps. But, but to me, connection to culture is learning our stories. It's learning how to weave. It's learning how to um, make a spear, all of those things that we did traditionally. But also to living in the contemporary world. And, you know, football's a part of our culture now, very much a part of our culture. And I think what the cultural team does here is connect people with all of those things. So I totally agree, um, obviously. Um, and for me, it's just something that I've lived every single day of my life. Um, so it's something that I guess I didn't realise until I got older, um, that it was learning those traditional practices. Um, it's just those values and the standards that we lived amongst um, all of our life. Um, so yeah, it is very fluent um, and we are constantly learning. So it's one of those things that you're never going to be an expert on. Um, so that's what I really love as well about this job um, is that, you know, we're actually learning from everybody, um, including the birth family. So um, that we it's something that, you know, everybody has different levels of their knowledge and understanding. Um, and, you know, we understand that. But yeah, for me, culture is just an everyday thing and how we've um, been brought up. What do you think it means for the children in care to be connected to culture or to hear about their culture? For me, um, connection to culture for our kids is, it's everything. They have to be connected. It's what Tint and I was saying. We, we have lived that, we've lived that experience our whole life and we want our kids to be able to live that experience because if they don't, you know, they're going to they're gonna start questioning when they get older. They're going to start asking, what, why, who am I, where do I belong and what's my connection? And I think, you know, kids love doing all the cultural stuff. They love, they do, they love, you know, ochre, they love painting themselves, they like dance, they, you know, and I think those things connect you to everything. If it's your song, you know, if it's your, um, you know, how your aunties weaved, how they taught you how to do that so that we can teach our kids how to do that. How, what the stories are that go with the country. What are the stories about the ocean? What are the stories about the whales? What are the stories about turtles? Um, Tintinara's family eat turtle. They still eat turtle. So, do you know, I mean, I think those kind of things and about, you know, that you do skin at kangaroos, they don't come from KFC. They actually have to, you know, you have to actually take the fur <laughs> off them. Um, and, you know, for them to be able to do that, make axes, they, we've done cultural camps where they've done that, where they've made coulomons and they've made um, shields, they've made canoes. All of the things that was a part of our history for thousands and thousands of years. Because that's definitely what we try and bring. Um, it is the t traditional learnings, but also with the modern day twist on it. So um, we're very big on connecting the kids um, to their family, um, to their country. So we often do um, return to country trips with kids. Um, so how we kind of look at it is it's kind of like the aunties and uncles just taking the kids back to family. So we very much, um, you know, network with the local communities that we like engaging with, um, we consult with the elders, um, we, you know, discuss, um, you know, welcomes and make it a really enriched um, process where they get welcomed um, on the country. We do like significant site tours, um, more so that the kids know who they are um, and where they come from. Um, you know, we actually have um, one of the, my favourite stories is um, one of our young people, um, he was probably about 14, 15. He was a bit hesitant. I was organising a return to um, country trip. He was a bit hesitant of wanting to go. Um, so, you know, I went and spoke to him and he said, you know, Arnie, I actually am a bit ashamed of being Aboriginal. And I was like, okay, well, you know, tell me more. Like, let me understand why. Um, and he said, because, you know, I just see like Aboriginals as ones that are doing negative things. And I said, well, 
give me one week and let me show you what you're seeing is not what Aboriginal's about. Mm. Um, and I said, let me show you what is out there. Um, and within that week, it, the transformation for this young boy um, was dramatic mm. um, to the point that before we left, and I'll try not to tear up because I always do, um, before I left, he's like, Arnie, I'm home. And I was like, yes, you are. And he said, um, I'm a warrior. And I said, you come from a long line of warriors. So he got to hear those stories from the elders, from the community. Um, and now his projection in life is dramatically different. Um, so he has been able to gain so much value um, about his identity through his culture. We want our kids that are in out of home care to know um, that, you know, they might be dealing with something now, um, but that doesn't determine who they can be in the future. And th we kind of mostly do that through cultural knowledge. That, that example that um, Tint gave was, they also went to the river where his grandmother used to sit and fish for yellow belly. And, on the, um, and I knew his grandmother and he was really shocked when I told him that, that I know your grandmother. And just that young man, now he's at university now. Um, he's at uni, he's amazing, isn't he? He's an amazing young man. He did a leaving, we, we did a leaving ceremony with him when he went. Um, and, and I think he was so proud of that, wasn't he? He went with the men, he went off with the men and they did their business and then they came back and they danced for us. It was amazing. And I think just the pride that he shows and his maturity and the respect that he shows to us um, is, is huge. It's, I think for him though, it just, he's always been such a nice young man, but he just, he's different now, he shines now. It's like his spirit shines. I think it also demonstrates how we can also be at different parts in our cultural identity and our cultural journey. So can you talk a little bit about what you find when you do find children at different points in their cultural journey and what it is that you do to help them in that space? I think there's quite a lot of things that we do. I think one of the things that Tint was saying about, you know, that we live this experience, we try to get them to live the experience of being Aboriginal too. Um, even if they're not with Aboriginal families, if they're you know, if we're very lucky, we get Aboriginal, we get non-Aboriginal carers that want to do that and try really hard to do that. It's not always the case. Um, a, a lot of non-Aboriginal people don't value our culture like we do. But, but I think when you, you can you can decide to not identify as an Aboriginal person if you don't have any information, right? If we give you the information. Um, engage you with your country, talk about your mob, talk about your families, talk about your clans, your lines, your so whatever it is, and you choose to not identify, that's your choice. But we find that kids don't, they identify. And, but most of the time, like the young man that Tintanara talked about, they have these preconceived ideas about what being Aboriginal means. And, you know, he came from a long line of, um, well, his grandmother was in care. So he, you know, so they have that horrible trauma history that his mother was the same and, you know, she was, had drug problems, all of these things. So, but she would not address her own history and so her trauma history impacted on them. And, you know, he, as a little tiny boy, used to get food and divide it into three. He had two siblings and make sure that everyone had a feed. It was sad, it, was, it used to be really sad. We used to do NAIDOC events and he would sit them on the ground and give them all the feed, yeah, because he'd, he'd done that. But our kids shouldn't have to do that, do you know. But but he he embraces his culture now, yeah, yeah. absolutely. So I think um, we understand um, that the children might be at different stages um, because we as staff, under uh, you know, might be going through different you know stages or um, have different knowledge. Um, so it's more around, you know, what do you know. Um, and it's different for children that have obviously been in, in care for, you know, since they were younger, because, you know, they're learning that cultural um, knowledge um, throughout the years. Whereas if we're getting children that are a bit older, it's about, okay, let's find out what you do know um, and let's us as staff 
enrich you with some knowledge, um, but also using you know the genograms and speaking to families, um, because for us, birth families are the knowledge holders. Um, so we very much empower the birth families when we talk to them. So when we do um, liaise around the cultural support plans, um, we as a team very much say, you know, you are the knowledge holders. And sometimes they might not feel comfortable in sharing that with us initially. And it takes, you know, a number of times. And we understand that distrust within um, the services and the industry. So um, we come from more of an understanding and a place of empowering them because it's around them sharing their story, story and knowledge that then can enrich the children. So we often do it in a way that if they might not feel comfortable in verbally just sitting there chatting with us, okay, well, let's look at what family contacts could look like. So, you know, we would liaise with our home care team and say, okay, well, um, can we not meet at this particular site because it's more significant to the family and, you know, um, th they want to do a painting together. So let's organise a painting and they can tell a story through a painting um, or both of them um, aren't sure how to do a weave like do weaving yeah. so can we not get another staff member to come and to do a teaching like a cultural teaching together yeah. um, so then that's a connection that they have so we really try and look outside the square as to what is a normal practice within the um, organization around the culture mm. I think what's interesting for me is sort of what you touched on earlier around this concept of, you know, you have traditional culture, then you've got this modern adaption of what we've held on to in terms of our traditional culture. And then I guess I'm also hearing that there's a difference in experience when you're in care and engaging with your culture in that context. Yeah. Is there anything you wanted to talk about in the sense of what's the difference between learning culture in care versus the way that we've learned outside of care? If, if Aboriginal children aren't with Aboriginal carers, how, you know, how, do we, how, do, how do you know about your Aboriginality? You learnt that from your family, you learn it from your extended family, you learn it from the gatherings that you had, you learn it from, as Tint said, you live it every day. Mm -hmm. If our, our kids don't live it, and some, they don't live it every day. So the difference is that we have to invite them into learning about who they are and what, where they belong there and, and what it is that makes them special as an Aboriginal person and what what I guess they can do to share their Aboriginality with other people because a lot of our kids now learn a bit of language so they teach the other kids and um, you know that's great that's an amazing thing and I think we at times um, you know one of the groups and I think tensed on some of these are girls that go out they go out to Southwest Rocks and they they do whale, they, do, they learn how to do the whale dance to call the whales in and they, um, they, then they do the brolga dance, they learn the brolga, but it was amazing because they did it at night and they had these big glowing wings and it's, it was spectacular, wasn't it? It was absolutely. So I guess there's a lot of, I guess, they're very strong in culture, um, the Southwest Rocks um, Aboriginal community, and they are very willing to share that with kids and I think that's where we like we link in as Tint says you link into those people that can do it it is that whole thing about we know each other we know the communities we know where people sit they don't know that they don't know that and you know we have we've got one person here that we call the the um Dungari bugle because she knows everything like you just go and ask her blah 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 blah, blah. yep yeah, that's honey jane blah, blah, blah. so do you know i mean i think the knowledge holders too sharing that knowledge with kids and young people is and even carers carers surprisingly actually really enjoy learning it, about it sometimes and yeah also for me like i can see that there is a difference um obviously when a, a child um, is learning about culture in the out-of-home care versus with their family um, we as an agency and, and denna said it many times that we obviously would prefer the children to be um, at home with family if it's safe um, so we, yes, they might be missing out on, um, you know, 
that learnings, but that's where we're trying to improve that and make the families and the community feel comfortable engaging with us. Mm -hmm. um, but like Denna mentioned, there's like a hundred and something staff. So for me, I think that the kids have got a more rich experience, um, that they are learning from 130 more aunties and uncles um, and those positive role models um, that are empowering them um, to share their knowledge um, as well as receive it. So yeah, we um, obviously they would get a different experience, um, but we're hoping to close the gap um, and make it more enriched. We had a young person that left care um, and she went to our future planning service after here and she said to the um, person, up there, Nat, up there, um, I used to hate Barandello. I hated you. And she said, you know what though? You have been the only people that have been in my life consistently and always been there for me, yeah. which is a kind of nice thing to know because, yeah. you know, usually we're called lots of different things, very <laughs> colourful language. Mm. Tint's been called a good few. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um. Um, and it's because they, I think because we're all seen and you'll hear us referring to each other as auntie and uncle, mm. yeah. um, we really do hold that to a high standard mm. that we are these children's aunties and uncles, whether it's biologically or not. Um, and that I think, you know, where we live in the same community, um, you know, we will see each other on weekends. That to me is special because um, we are held accountable and so we should be um, to not only the, the birth families, the community, but we're held accountable by the kids. Mm -hmm. So I tell you, if, if we said we're going to do something and they see me walking down the street, Auntie Tin! <laughs> <laughs> so, um, but that's what it should be like. Yeah. Um, and, it's, and that is part of that that cultural values yeah. as well is that, you know, we we also value everybody's voice similar. Mm -hmm. So we have that within the organisation that Denna as the CEO deems herself not as more important than anybody else within the organisation. And our voices are all as special as hers. But we, we do that for our children too, mm -hmm. is because each one of their voices are very important to us. It sort of sounds like to me very similar to, you know, that concept of kinship that I feel like we all got the privilege of yeah. experiencing outside of care. It's almost like you've created that kinship system for them inside your That's agency. That's what we try to do because, you know, some of these kids are so disconnected. Um, they need to know that there are people there. There are people that are Aboriginal that value them and want to support them and move them into their, their life journey so that they can be proud of who they are. Um, if you kind of get that, it means that you've made a connection with that, that, that young person, that you've made some difference, whether it be small and it doesn't, all we sometimes we can do is plant a seed. We can't even grow it until they choose to do that. So yeah, yeah. So, yeah we d definitely try and create our own internal kinship um, arrangements. Even when we're doing the trips back to country for children, um, we explain the process that we've taken um, in, in regards to consulting elders and speaking to aunties and uncles and, um, and you know, sitting down having a barbecue like for dinner and yeah. like it's not a formal thing. And, um, you know, they'd say to me, oh, can't we get KFC and Maccas? And I said, well, when I used to go on road trips or when I go on road trips, we don't have KFC and Maccas. We packed a little sandwich and a lunch and yeah. we'd sit on the side of the road at a park and have it. And, mm. um, and I said, and you know why I do it? And I said, because even when you, you become adults and you become parents, you can take your children or family on this same journey and you can say, remember that time we stopped at the hot springs yeah. and then we try to push Honey <laughs> Tin into the, um, into the hot springs? Yeah. I said, that becomes your memory. Mm. Um, and then, you know, it doesn't have to be. Culture is not about fanciness. It's not about, you know, those significant events. It's just about those day-to-day memories yeah. and values. It's the day-to-day -day stuff is where you learn culture. Yeah. And, yeah. and how you learn it yeah. is through other Aboriginal people. Even the way you're talking, you know, taking them back on those trips to yeah. country, it sounds like you would just be jumping in the car with your auntie going back home. Like 100%. It's, just, it's yeah. not like you're going with Barandala, you're going with your auntie. And that's <laughs> how I try and engage the communities. Um, so obviously, you know, they're 
a high level of distrust and we understand that um, and that's how I like to explain it to the community because um, they're like oh do we need to have our working with children checks and police checks and I said well we will do our own risk assessments but how I see it is it's just some aunties and uncles taking kids back to meet up with you. Um, let's just chuck a big barbecue in the um, which park and I said get the family to come and we will do our own internal like risk assessments and that you know we will be making sure that the kids are safe and being observed like they are in normal family contacts but from the community's point of view they've just got kids coming back having a feed having a play with their their cousins and their extended family um, so it is just aunties and uncles yeah. bringing them back can you talk a little bit more about that process that you go through when you're planning those trips to country you know there's a lot um, yeah. <laughs> only because in you know we've already protocols. we've already talked yeah. about this around you know those community cultural protocols that are the basic foundation that we need to follow um, and then I understand and take into consideration each country is different each tribe each family um, so obviously it's around consulting with the elders within the community it's it's consulting with local Aboriginal organisations. Let's find out from the family, who do they believe? Um, so we're more guided by the community. So it's an initial conversation maybe with the birth family and chances are they'll link us up to somebody or um, typical black, black fuller connections yeah. um, that, you know, because I'm not big with sports. Yeah. Um, <laughs> we'll, I'll know somebody <laughs> that oh, they played football or yeah. like things. So we'll reach out to them and just say, who do we need to talk to? Um, so we, we let the family and the community lead us as to who they believe. So, um, you know, we'll have others, you know, we'll let staff members know and chances are there's somebody from that country that works here. Um, and it's like, okay, let's get everybody in and let's come up with a process. So let's, you know, consult with the, the elders so we can do it the right way of getting welcomed onto country because I certainly am not going to other countries <laughs> and not getting welcomed on there appropriately. Um, mm -hmm. Let's do it like a little, you know, ceremony of where they're getting smoked and where the kids are getting welcomed back. Let's make it a significant event where they have elders that are coming in and sharing stories and having a laugh and having a feed because obviously I love a good feed so um, you know let them know that that's what we kind of want to happen um, you know you consult with the land councils any of the elders groups um, we very much as an organization um, tr try to remain neutral mm -hmm. and I think that's the the key is that um, we will work with everybody and anybody that is willing so um, how we get you know some people are surprised and how we get you know certain community members in the same room Room, mm. and how we do it is through respect um, and we're respectful of each individual but the focus is always on the child yeah. so what's in the best interest of the child so it's those things that we kind of let's consult with everybody yep. and then let's come up with a plan and then chances are like people will want to work with us because they can see we have the child's best interest at heart. I think um, what Tint said is very true. I think I remember Tint took kids back to Sherberg and that was, um, I don't know if you know much about Sherberg, but it's quite a close community. Um, and Tint did a huge amount of work um, with the elders, with the lands council, with the, the agency yeah. there. Um, but she went and she took the kids and was told to be off before dark. Yeah. 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 And which we were very respectful. Yep. So leave before dark. Um, yeah. As we would do, you know, anyway. in our personal lives. Um, mm. Yeah, tell me where I'm not allowed to go <laughs> yeah. or what I'm not allowed to do because I ain't getting grabbed. Nah. <laughs> <laughs> so we very much are like that. Yeah. that it's like what we've learnt ourselves, ourselves. Um, is what then we're actually saying to the kids this to, to this is the practice because this is what they hear that conversation. They're like, Arnie, what? 
thought you were saying that for? And I said, because I'm telling you now, I'm not on my country and I need to be respectful for your country. And then they can learn from that. So even when we're out there, um, you know, been told be elf here before dark yeah. you trust me i'm i'm in my room i already had dinner <laughs> by dark time and i'm just sitting in my little motel um, and you know other things of you know don't go there and okay yeah. all right um and then the kids like oh but why and i said because well you're told not to we yeah. were told not to yeah. and it's as simple as that they might want to share the story which they tend to do after yeah. um, but once they can see that we're respective of what their local law mm -hmm. is, then um, they're more likely to be open and share the experience with the children. You know, there has been times where, you know, we have community members that think that we did was great. Um, but then we also have times where, you know, community members want to share with us their journey and their story and that's where the the anger um, might be coming from um, so we it's a it's a balance um, because then at that time instead of exposing the child it's trying to understand from that person's point of view um, that community member the elder or the family member why they're feeling that way um, yeah. so a lot of times just through discussion um, we can understand why they might be feeling that way. You know, they might have been removed themselves um, and it might mean explaining the process. So we actually hold a lot of knowledge around um, the child protection industry in general. Um, so it might mean us saying, you know, giving advice lightly to say, um, you know, you know, your grandkids, you're talking about that they were removed. Um, you know that there is a process that you can follow around getting contact. Um, and then it, so it's more coming from that understanding background of wanting to learn and understanding their point of view that most of the time we can assist them in their own journey because they might have, you know, trauma that they haven't dealt with. Um, and, you know, so we as an organisation and Aboriginal people within the organisation, it is a very tricky balance. Yeah. Um, and that, you know, we, we have to, um, we hold positions within the organisation, but within the community that, um, yeah, we have, to, we have to inform people um, so that we can hopefully, like I said before, we would hope that we would never have another child come into care if they're safe. Um, so yeah, like, let's learn from um, people's point of views and let's see how we can educate and work together. A lot of people are afraid too that they're going to um, be disrespectful to Aboriginal people so they don't do anything. Mm. They kind of just sit there. But all you have to do is do exactly that, have a conversation, be respectful and talk to people and they'll tell you, even if you say the wrong thing, we're not going to eat you. Yeah. And the document is only as good as the intent behind it. Yeah. So you can create the best document in the world, but if you don't actually have intent to follow that through um, or the knowledge behind it, then it's just a piece of paper with words on it. So um, in saying, you know, touching on what you said, a cultural support plan can be at any stage of the journey that the child's at. And that's why it's a living document. Um, and that's why it, it's updated regularly. And it might take, you know, three years for a birth family to feel comfortable to start sharing stories, but that's okay because what else could you be doing besides that? So um, a cultural support plan isn't just a, you know, oh, we've done this. Okay, we'll move on to the next goal. We'll do this. Yeah. Um, you know, it's, it's multiple things happening at the same time, um, which might, you know, eventually meet its goal down here, or you might never because it might change into something else. But um, it can be very fluent. Um, and yeah, either it's how you look at it, either it's words on a piece of paper that you have to complete, um, or it's something that is so much more enriched and that it can change a child's life. Yeah. When they're invited into learning about their culture, they take it up and they then, they seek out other things, you know. Um, I think, you know, um, 
at the recent Absent um, conference, they had the brog dancers that are from like that high and and to to young people. But it was amazing to watch these little kids dancing and being so proud of who they were. And I think if we can teach our kids to be proud of who they are uh, instead of as Tint said, that young man said, I don't want to be Aboriginal, I'm embarrassed to be Aboriginal. Um, you know, we're the longest surviving race on this planet. Like, I mean, we can't, we, we've done something right because we're still here, like, you know. But I think, yeah, like, it's so much more than that though. It's like yeah. Tint was saying, it's such a rich culture. We have such a rich culture and such great stories and dreamings and song lines and, and I think, we don't invite our kids into that stuff very often. So I think what Tint does is remarkable and that's true. I, I think I wish everyone had a, had a Tint, a cultural, you know, like really, because it, that, like what she said, it is either a piece of paper that's just a bit of paper mm. or it's something that absolutely is driven to ensure this kid gets what they should get. You know? we, everything that we do, um, is also a part of the cultural support plans yeah. because it's like, um, you know, everything we can't just be, uh, we've got to practice what we preach. So yeah. internally, like we refer to auntie and uncles and, you know, even sitting here now, you will see me wait for Dana to respond out of respect first. Mm -hmm. um, and it's just those standard cultural practices that um, can't necessarily um, be teach like taught yeah. they've got to be experienced simple things that like non-aboriginal agencies um, or people can do is just yeah. part of that respect is something simple as you know goodness forbid an elder is standing in your waiting room because there's nowhere else to sit mm -hmm. you know what you go and get your chair out of your office and you take it out to them and let them sit on a chair mm -hmm. um, you offer them a cup of tea or a cup of coffee or a um, a cup and don't put it in those little plastic cups yeah, if you yeah if you're using um, an actual cup like a mug like a a mug and you're walking around with a mug you get them a mug mm. um, I don't care if you have to go down to the street and buy one <laughs> because that then is so disrespectful mm. and it comes back to that cultural knowledge and understanding yeah. why they might see that it's disrespectful the thing is and my dad always raised me to believe you treat people the way that you want to be treated um, and I think people forget things like you were just saying like You've, here, you have this plastic mug art. I've got this cup here. Now, what are we going to... Do you know what I mean? Those things about... And for elders in our community, if they're treated respectfully, which they should be, they respect you in return. You know, we, Aboriginal agencies differ very much in the fact that we have anything come in the door. It doesn't matter whether it's to do with the outer home care sector, foster care, whatever. People will just come here at times to have a yarn about something and or they'll ask for someone, can I talk to them, I won't really want to do this. That's the difference I think between Aboriginal and And you can actually get in the door too, like people will let you in and sit down on the lounge. And if you want to work with Aboriginal people, it's like I say, treat them the way you want to be treated. You don't, yeah. you know, we aren't any different to you in that regard. We do have feelings and we do get offended and we do get, you know, if you're treated like a second class citizen, you'll behave like one. You obviously have professional obligations. You've got rules, standards, everything to follow. But I guess what I also hear is that we have those same rules and expectations from our mob and our communities, yeah. which is almost worse, like your balance. <laughs> Probably worse, yeah. right? Probably more so the expectations, I would say, are a lot higher. Yeah. What is it that you do to balance those expectations or to balance the fact that it's almost like another regulator in this space for you guys? I think what Tint said, we're always respectful in that regard to whoever we deal with. We're apolitical too, we don't get into politics because the minute you walk into, you start to engage in politics on one side or the other, you're done in this community. We have never ever been political. Um, in saying that, we are political in the context of our kids and our, you know, we will have our say and we will do those things. But we also, I think, um, we work with other agencies respectfully. We don't pick and choose who we work with. Sometimes the community really kind of doesn't know where to put us mm. because of that reason, because we're not, we don't go, oh, well, we're, we're, we're only going to support South Kempsey or we're only going to support Burnt Bridge. We support all the communities. And I think 
that's the difference. And we don't buy, we don't, you know, if, if they come around and want you to join in, to them, we just go, no, we're not, we don't buy into politics. We just don't, because you, you're done. You're absolutely done, yeah. And I think it's about being aware that it's there. Yeah. So it's that constant battle, I guess, that we are facing. Like, where's that line drawn? Um, so, you know, if you if you see some like body and they've got something to say, look, I hear what you're saying, but we can't talk about it here, but come in to the office yeah. tomorrow, first thing, and we'll have a yarn about it. Mm. Um, and people, once they feel heard, they will understand. So, um, and then we have to understand too that staff are dealing with that at different levels. Yeah. So, you know, you have people um, who might have family members that are in care. Um, we have, you know, might have people that are on country, you know, working amongst their families um, and people that are off country, um, but have families here. So it's about us getting to know the workers and the team as well and understand and help them through that process because it can be difficult. Um, and, you know, we do get complaints um, around things and it's just trying to support the team through that and understand, okay, well, what have we done? What can we do better? Um, you know, yeah, you probably shouldn't have like reacted. Yeah. So what can we do next time? Yeah. Um, so, but it's about at least acknowledging it so that um, you kind of know as managers and executive teams that, okay, well, this is gonna be a bit sketchy for this worker so let's send this one out yeah. or let's have a conversation and a debrief with this person before they go and after they return yeah. um, because we knew that this was going to be a bit of a full-on day for them or you know they've, they've got abused on their way back from lunch um, okay let's sit and debrief about that yeah. this is our living and breathing community so they're vulnerable wherever they go. And you know, whether we have never removed a child ever and we never would, but we still get called black docs at times, you know, and they have to live with that. And look, I admire the staff because they do. They just, you know, um, not don't want to talk about it now, not my, I'm out of work. Um, but you know, they also ring up and go, like I was saying, are they drinking up the pub? Well, they're allowed, they're yeah. allowed. They're not on call, they're not at work. They're allowed to have a drink. Yeah, yeah. So you hear it all the time and I think, yeah, but I think exactly what you said is really important. I think, um, you know, they, they walk a very fine line, Aboriginal workers, and I don't think non-Aboriginal agencies understand quite what that's like. Yeah. If they're not happy, they're going to let us know. Yeah. Um, and, you know, people are from the community. So they, you know, people know where we live. Um, they know where, oh, yeah. you know, where yeah, we go where shopping. We live, yeah. You know, it's like... I can hide in the pee yeah. <laughs> We get the funny comments from some of the, you know, the community. Yeah, Byron Nullah there. Oh. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> Only because it's it's not as a, a negative, yeah. but just as oh, that thing, like, you know. They know you. Yeah. In mm. non-Aboriginal organisations, you can take your uniform off mm -hmm. and chances are people aren't going to know where you work or what you do. We don't take our uniforms. We take our uniforms off, but they're always there. Mm. We are a part of the community um, yeah. and I think for that's my biggest thing is around um, let's support the Aboriginal workers in non-Aboriginal yeah. agencies mm. because this, it's so much more complex that the staff are dealing with um, yeah. that they probably don't feel comfortable in sharing but get to know them, support them, guide them um, and then you'll understand more of what they're going through.